I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. Religious people are afraid of going to hell. Hell is what you experience when you die and you meet the person that you were supposed to become. I've loved your work for a long time, but I haven't really known the man. And so I was deep diving, deep diving into the man behind the scenes, more than the persona. Here's one thing I noticed. You went into radio, you went into politics, you went into TV. We all know you as a speaker. My goodness, it seemed like you were searching for a platform to share your voice, to share your perspective. In the early stages, in the early days, what was driving that? That is a very good question. I've been reflecting on that because I just discovered my birth parents at 76. I just laid eyes on a picture of them at 76, which proves that God is full of surprises. Because you didn't, remember, you didn't know your birth parents because you were adopted at, the, at six weeks old, right? Yes, right. And so my son, my oldest son, did a search and found them, found where they were born, one hour from where I am now in Atlanta. But I remember years ago listening to a motivational record by a guy named Earl Nightingale. And he said, we become what we think about. And he talked about if you want to do something, he said that you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. And during that time, I, I remember seeing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. come to Miami, Florida and Malcolm X. And I love how they spoke. And I you, said, you saw them like you went out to the event and you saw yeah, them. I went to the event. And I saw them and I said, I'd like to do that. I liked how people responded. And, and I like what I felt in my heart that I did not know at the time that I was looking at my destiny and everything. I believe that there are moments in your life that you get a glimpse of who you're supposed to be that calls your name. I remember my son, John Leslie, the first time he stepped into a recording studio, it was like he went into a daze that he was in his rightful place, how he looked at the equipment and how he moved around the studio like he was home. And, 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 and he had a love and affinity for music. And, and so I have a love and affinity for words. And I decided I wanted to be like them. The man who interrupted my thinking and my vision of myself, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded, as you're aware, and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I fell again in the eighth grade. But my junior year, I met this man whose personality was just like yours, Mark. And and he said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for me. And I said, I can't do that, sir. Why not? I'm not one of your students. He said, do it anyhow. And I said, I can't, sir. And the other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. And he asked, what's DT? He's a dumb twin. And they all erupted in laughter. And I said, I This is junior sir. year. So this is like you're, what, 14, 15? No, I was 16 at the time. Yes, 16. my junior year. Yes. So you've defined yourself, you know, so, so, I mean, if we go back and most people know your story, but, but some may not, right. You know, you're, you're adopted at the age of six weeks old. You know, your adopted mother worked her tail off. There's nine kids in the family, I believe. Seven seven kids in the family. She's working her tail off. And then through schooling, you're just placed. Like I have four kids. If, <laughs> if, if, if some teacher came along and defined what, and I know it was a different age. Um, I know it was a different place in Miami in what would have this been the fifties or early sixties, like different time, different age, uh, you know, being, being a, a black man or a black young boy during th that era. Like I can imagine the differences, but boy, I mean, you, you spent all of those years defining yourself, running through your head, this story of your place and you're the dumb twin and all of that stuff. In addition to being in a culture where you are demonized, 
where systems are designed to deny you mm-hmm. and where you have to constantly look for ways to win. I remember going to work with my mother on Miami Beach and they had signs that said Jews, dogs, and coloreds not allowed. And there were places on Miami Beach that dogs could go that I couldn't go. (laughs) So when you're in a culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self, And then you raised in poverty, but we were poor and we didn't know it. (laughs) So to fight through that in a, in a culture that is designed to marginalize you and to deny you that's a struggle, but I didn't know it at the time. And I did not focus on that. What I focused on, which I encourage everyone to do focus on trying to find a way to win. How can I overcome this? What is it I have to do? What radical change do I have to make within myself? What is it I have to learn? If you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. But if you're willing to learn, no one can stop you. What is it I have going for me? And what is it I have going against me? I remember uh, sending uh, uh, a my eight track to Gunther Rinker, who, who sponsored a motivational infomercial for Tony Robbins. And I said, I have an inspirational story too. And they sent me back a letter. Yeah, your story is inspirational, but you black. <laughs> I said, we don't believe America is ready for a black motivational speaker. So I sent them a letter back saying, thank you for reminding me that I'm black. I never would have known that if you hadn't told me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I but you laugh I believe- you laugh but it's I mean it's it's not funny in in any respect like it, it's not it's not funny it's it's tragic I didn't it's get terrible. angry I did laugh but I laughed because I laughed as I was writing the letter saying thank you for reminding me <laughs> I wondered what were they thinking when they got that? Because I ended it by saying, "I'll see you from the top." <laughs> ah, uh, okay. So, so here's here's the question I have, and and we can we can meander all over the place because I love it. We can try and stitch things together, but you know, you're so you're in junior year, you're 16, your teacher is challenging you to put that thing on the board. Um, the reason why I took a step back to the time, the age, um, your ethnicity, all of those things, your level of poverty um, is I'm curious whether your confidence or drive came from within a fire, a fight. uh, Let me show you what I can do. Or sometimes the young are full of, uh, full of, you know, vinegar because they just don't know better. They just don't know how hard it's about to be. Right. They're almost blindly foolish. And then, and then they go headlong in and they see all the success. And so I'm curious about these pivot points in your life, these transition points. The where pivot point gone started early, early. I, I remember five years of age. That's when the hunger begins. I wrote this oh. book called you've got to be hungry. Mm-hmm. I was downtown with my mother and it was 95 degrees in Miami, it was hot. And and my mother had to take me with her. She adopted seven children. And my brothers and sisters and neighbors would keep them, the other six of us, but they wouldn't keep me. And they said, Mamie, uh, Leslie, a little touch to the head. He's just too much to handle. You're gonna have to take him with you. And I was downtown with my mother and I, I was hot and thirsty and I saw a water fountain and I let my mother's hand go and I ran to this water fountain and started drinking from it. And she was yelling at me, Leslie, come back, come back. And then she grabbed me the back of the neck. She said, don't you do that. Mm-hmm. And she slung me to the ground and she started punching me in the face and in the head. And I, I said, mama, it's me with this crazed look in her eyes. Mama, it's me. And at that moment, a white policeman came over and he was hitting his nightclub in his hand. He said, listen, you beat that little nigga boy enough. That a learning. And, and mama stopped and he walked away and he just laughed. My eye 
was swollen, my lip was busted. And as I was crying, he walked away and he was laughing at me. <laughs> I could hear his laughter now. The white kids were laughing too. And I asked her, I said, Mama, why did you beat me like that? And she picked me up and she said, Leslie, I'm so sorry. And she started crying. She said, that white policeman was approaching you and he had a billy club in his hand. And had he hit you with that club, he'd have had to kill me. And I left you and your brothers and sisters to fend for yourselves. I said, but mama, I was just drinking water like those other kids. Leslie, Leslie, we can't drink from those water fountains. As for whites only, we have to drink from the ones that says, for coloreds only. And I th then knew that I lived in two different worlds. I then knew when I got on the bus with my mother, we paid the same fare as white people. But when it was packed in the back, we couldn't sit in the front. Mama would say, keep moving, Leslie, past that yellow line. We have to sit in the back and we have to stand up. I said, but there's seats up here. Leslie, keep moving. I knew it's a different world. And that created a hunger, a defiance that I will not be denied, a hunger to take care of my mother, to, to make a difference with my life against all odds. I, I remember the tipping scale was when this lady, Miss Harris, she asked my mother to go look for a hat in one of the rooms that she wanted to go out. Get my purple hat, Mamie. And Mama went in the room and Mama started clapping her hands. And I was curious. I was supposed to be scrubbing up spots off the floor in the kitchen. I said, Mama, what is it, Leslie? Why are you clapping your hands? Don't you worry. You just continue to do what you are doing. And then she came out of the room and said, Miss Harris, it, it's not in there. Miss Harris said, then go in that room down the hall there on the left. It probably is in there. And once again, my mother started clapping her hands. I said, Mama, what is it, Leslie? Why are you clapping your hands? She said, didn't I tell you pay attention to what you're doing? Clean those spots up off the floor in the kitchen? Yes, ma'am. She was irritated. And then Miss Harris, she came over to me. She said, I can tell you why she's clapping her hands. When I have colored people looking for something in another room, I can't see them. I make them clap their hands to make sure that they're not stealing. Mm. I was shocked. I dropped the washcloth. I stood up and I looked her in the eyes. And during this time, black people were not allowed to look white people in the eyes. I looked her in the eyes and said, Ms. Harris, my mother is not a thief. She's a Christian. She would never steal from you or anybody. When she keep your children, she talk about my children, the Harris children. She respects you. She respects everybody. And she was shocked because the voice in which I spoke of defiance and looking her in the eyes, she just walked away and she didn't say anything. And I kneeled back down on that floor and I started scrubbing that floor. And I remember saying to myself the Jewish mantra, never again. When I become a man, nobody will make my mother clap her hands because they think that she's stealing. And that gave birth in me a hunger, the fight against anything that would prevent us from living a good life, anything that would prevent me from being able to provide for my mother, anything that would rob us of our dignity and 
and sense of self, listening to those motivational messages over and over again. It gave me a vision of myself beyond my mental conditioning, a vision of myself beyond the culture that was designed to demonize me and destroy my sense of self and allowed me to begin to see a vision of myself in the future, not being held back by racism and discrimination to become an unstoppable person. That's how that hunger was given birth. <laughs> and so, I mean, of course, 50 plus years of remarkable storytelling. As you started to go into radio, as you started to develop your voice, as I mentioned, you know, most people know you as a motivational speaker, but there's so much more to you than that. Um, this drive that you had, the, the work, because, I mean, when, when you moved to one place, you had to sleep in garbage bins. I mean, you, you, it's, not like, it's not like it was a quick rise to fame and to fortune. You had to work really hard. And so I'm curious how much of this was tied into ego, how much of this was tied into let me show you what I can do, as you just talked about that hunger, and how much of this was just you knew you were destined for people to listen to you. It was tied into reason. Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, mm -hmm. you can endure almost anyhow. Mm -hmm. I never focused on the fact that I, I spent a week in low temperatures in Columbus, Ohio, sleeping in a garbage bin. I never focused on that. I, I never focused on the tough times that I've gone through. Time when I spoke for a group in Wildwood, Florida, and a guy opened the door, and I, I was standing there, and I said, I'm here to speak for the graduation class. And he said, you're not. The speaker is Les Brown and his band are renowned. I said, I am Les Brown. He said, you Les Brown? I said, yes. He looked at me as if he'd seen a ghost. He thought I was Les Brown and the man of our town. No, the band leader. No. <laughs> and he spit on the floor. He's trying to spit on my shoe. I'm so glad it didn't hit it because I'd have whooped his behind. <laughs> so he went to the microphone and said, ladies and gentlemen, Les Brown. And they had all these album covers on the wall. And he went off stage left. And I came to the microphone and the audience got quiet. <laughs> Okay, can I tell you that happened to me on a less embarrassing stage once? I was part of an event and they said, We're gonna bring Mark to the stage. And the place went bananas. And I'm thinking, what is going on? I don't even know any of these people. <laughs> and I was at a church and I didn't realize that there was a, a youth pastor named Mark there. Everybody thought they were bringing the youth pastor out, not me to make some random speech, some random announcement. <laughs> And so, yes. so luckily there was no racism involved, but I can tell, I can tell you that that was 20 years ago. And it's, I still can feel the sting of the disappointment in everyone's eyes when they realize that they're shouting for the wrong person. Yeah. I can see the shock in their eyes and how the room got quiet. Yeah. What you about to do? <laughs> yeah. What did you do? Did you win them over? Yes. Did I you slay had to. It? Yes. I, 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 I I, I looked in, in, on the wall in the back and there was a theme that says, this is the time to seize the hour of your future. And I spoke from that. I spoke from my heart. I, I trained speakers how to speak from their heart. And at first they were squirming. They didn't want to applaud me and they didn't want to recognize it be uplifted, but I was coming for them. And they knew it. And after a while, they started clapping a little bit. And then they got all up in there when I started coming deep in their heart and emphasizing that this is the hour to celebrate these young people. And we are here because young people, your mothers and fathers, your, your grandparents and family members and friends are here 
to celebrate you. I want you young people to stand and give them a round of applause for their, their love and their support. And so the young people stood up and, and now the parents, the grandparents, everybody look and feel it proud. Mm, that's a good thing. And then I had the parents and the grandparents and friends and family members to applaud the young people for this moment in their lives, this chapter, this new beginning. And they stood up, clapped to them. And then they sat down and they looked at me like, now what you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and then I took one step back and I, I went up in there and started speaking and, and captured them. I got a standing ovation. That was my first speech outside of Miami, Florida. Uh, one of the young people in my youth training class she she recommended me, and they thought she was talking about Les Brown and his band of renown. So I said, oh, yeah, you know Les Brown. He has my mother works for him. And that, her, her mother was a volunteer for a youth center that I had. And that's how I ended up going there. But there are things that happen to you in life. And, and one of the things I strongly believe that we are stronger than anything that can happen to us. I believe that, that what's most important, people right now going through a tough time, people who have lost their homes going through foreclosures and had their cars repossessed, uh, 47 million people have lost their jobs. What's most important is that they focus on where they want to go and not on what happened to them. That's not going anywhere because where focus goes, energy flows. And so you have to look at this thing called life and say, what do I do with this? What am I supposed to do with this? And, and, and keep your mind stayed on that. How often did you ask yourself that question during those early days? Say it again. How often did you ask yourself that question Quite during those early days? Yeah. <laughs> Quite often. Yeah, because it just seems like it would have been knock me. after knock after knock, right? Yes. And so you have to you have to play a game with yourself. I said every knock that I put on a door, I'm reminded that even a broke clock is right twice a day. And if that knock, a person look out and say, no, and slam the door, I have a choice. I can become depressed, or I can say, I'm getting closer. <laughs> and that's the game I played with myself, and I had a lot of time to play with that. <laughs> that I'm getting closer, and I'm getting closer. Let me give you a good example of that. I said I saw Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking, on the Robert Shuler Show. And so I said, I'm going to be on the Robert Chula show. And so I decided, anybody I met, hey, hi, my name is Les Brown. What's your name? My name is Bob. Mark, I'm a motivational speaker. I'm going to be on the Robert Chula show. When? Do I don't know when. I don't know. They haven't booked me yet. <laughs> they haven't booked me yet. But do you know Robert Chula? No. Mark, do you know anybody who knows Robert Chula? No. Well, if you do, here's my card. Let him know that I want to be on his show. Did that for two years. I was flying on Southwest Airlines from Detroit to Chicago, about five people on the flight. And seated next to me, a guy named Lafayette Jones. And he was born February the 17th, just like myself. I said, hi, my name is Les Brown. What's your name? He said, Lafayette Jones. I said, I'm going to be on the Robert Schuller show. He said, you are? When? I said, I don't know. Do you know Robert Shuler? He said, no. But Bob Johnson, who I work for, uh, he gave Robert Shuler a million dollars. What do you do? I'm a motivational speaker. You a motivational speaker? Yes. Are you good? Yes. Man, oh my goodness, our speaker canceled. How much do you charge? I didn't even know what to charge at that time. I said, uh, how much have you allocated? He said, $5,000. You said, done. <laughs> I just looked at it, but I didn't answer immediately. Wait, wait, what year was this? What year was this? 
I don't know years. I just know quotes <laughs> I don't know immediately, but because had I opened my mouth, I'd have spoken in unknown tongues. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, that'll work for the beginning. And, and, and so I spoke for Mr. Johnson at that. When I got through, I got a standing ovation. He ran to the podium. He said, man, you are good. He said, if I can do anything ever to help you, let me know. I said, do you know Robert Shula? He said, yes, I know Bob very well. I contributed a million dollars to his ministry. I said, I'd like to be on the Robert Shula show. He said, you got it. The next morning at the Riverfront Apartments in Detroit, Michigan, the phone rang. Hello? Hello, this is Robert Shula. I said, no, it's not. Yes, it is. I said, whoa, it is you. I said, hold it, I got to go to the bathroom. And I said, but it's number one, it's not number two, it's number one. <laughs> so I went to the bathroom, I came back as fast as I could. I said, Mr. Shuler, how are you? He said, Bob Johnson told me you want to be on my program. I said, yes, sir. He said, I will have my secretary call you and book you. And he interviewed me on national television. It's we call that we call that manifesting these days. But back then, like this was this was unheard of thinking, wasn't it? I mean, you Absolutely. must have just been the, yeah. the kookiest guy you know, around. People talk about the law of attraction. I I don't believe in that uh, because I believe that what you think about and that you work to bring about, ah. you begin to attract things in your life. And then the law of attraction, they never mention work, <laughs> right? Okay. And so, so it happened. And so through persistence, through what we focus on, through effort and time, we can change our lives dramatically and the lives of others. We, we can make a greater impact in this world. It was uh, one Benjamin Franklin who said that until those of us who are not affected are as outraged as those who are affected by injustice. Until that happens, until they are outraged, change will never take place. And so we're living in a time, there's a reckoning where people from all walks of life, and I believe because of the internet, that injustices are being exposed and decent-minded people of conscience and and morals and not religion because hatred is more powerful than religion and and saying this is wrong we need to do something about this can i, and, can I ask just yeah. just because I'm, I'm so interested in like maybe the 60s 70s 80s because you know if you were to tell someone today i want to be a professional speaker they go Okay, you know, lots of professional speakers. But you were in a time in an era where, I mean, I, I went to film school. When I went to film school, we still shot stuff on tape. You produced VHS tapes. I've heard, I've heard you speak from, I've heard you speak where you're like, hey, they booked me. They said, book these number of tapes. I get the tapes done. I don't have the money. I should, you know. So like, but, but you're in a time where being a motivational speaker I, was not very mainstream as far as I can tell. Being, no. uh, being a, a black man in this role may have been even more foreign and you're going out and you're doing this stuff. Like, like I can see how, how, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King may have influenced your speaking style. I could see how a lot of preachers of the time may have influenced your speaker style, but, but it seems like most people who were built the way you were built just went off and became a preacher. Why did you pick this other path? Uh, because you're a man of faith as well. So it seems like you would have just siphoned into like becoming a pastor or a preacher or, or kind of speaking from the pulpit. People who speak in church only speak to 15% of the population. I wanted to speak to 100%. I wanted to speak to the world. Why? Preachers preach Why? the gospel about Jesus. Yeah. I preach the gospel that Jesus preached. So I teach and train speakers how to speak and give a message to create an experience with their words that will transform people individually and collectively. 
But what was it when you were younger that didn't feel, it didn't feel enough because, because you, you, I, I believe you must've envisioned something so grand and so big and you pursued it in a time again, in a time where it's like, I, I'm just, that's what I marvel at. I marvel at your boldness and then your commitment and your dedication to it. When the path, the easier, simpler path that many, many, many more people took was just to go a different direction. So I'm always curious why, like, what was it within you, that hunger where you that said, I'm not going to speak to the 15. I'm going to speak to the hundred percent. Yeah. Because I heard a reporter ask my mother, how did you know you could raise seven children by yourself? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, I just believe the Lord would make a way somehow. And so when I tackle things, I believe that somehow, if I do what I can do, somehow, if I give it everything I have and my, my effort is not good enough, somehow, that if I dig deeper in myself and I'm hungry enough, there will be an intervention that things will happen. The angels that supposed to guard me that's in the spar say, wait a minute, stop. You don't have to finish my fingernails. Leslie's in trouble. He needs some help. <laughs> Just believe that I'm protected and that, that God will make a way somehow. And that's the faith that my mother had when she met my birth mother, as told to me by my godfather. I will take good care of them. They will not go to bed hungry. And they will always have clothes on their back and a roof over their head. And she made that happen. She delivered that. I believe that our faith is a down payment on our future. And I believe that when we have faith in ourselves, faith in our dreams and faith in a power greater than ourselves, that we can do more and accomplish more. But sometimes life can knock you senseless. Sometimes we give up because we don't know how strong we are. Remember that 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 play Lion King Simba, you're more than that which you have become. And so I believe that we are stronger than we give ourselves credit for being, and that we have to challenge ourselves and push ourselves and stretch ourselves. And that's when we go beyond our comfort zone. There's power in pursuit. And that's when through that hunger that you discover a part of yourself that you don't know right now, that you'll never discover in your comfort zone. When did you feel, at what point did you feel like you could take a breath? Not that you've made it, but at what point did you look around and go, you know, damn, I'm Les Brown. You, this is going to shock you. About a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. You're you're seventy five right now. Seventy six. Seventy six. So you were seventy four and a half when you were like, "Damn, I'm Les Brown." Yes. The I said people are listening to me. I went to an event. I had to speak, and it was outside at at Miami Dade Community College, and there were other speakers. And when they called me up, there was a lot of noise. When they called me up and I started speaking, everybody got quiet. And I can hear them saying, shh, it's Les Brown. I was back home in Miami. And after I spoke, I said to my daughter, Ona, I said, Ona, they listened to me. They said that I was Les Brown. She said, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> I said, Wow, because the speaker was outside and the, the fact that they got quiet, it felt different and I can hear my voice. It was a different kind of experience. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. And what I realized in that moment, I never focus on who I was becoming. I just focus on where I was going. 
Mm. What I wanted to do with my life, I wanted to make my mother proud. Mm. I was determined that I was going to live a life that mattered. I was determined that I wanted to live a life that count. That this woman who never had any children adopted seven children, third grade education. And she said, I'll take them. Wow, what faith. And so I'm my mother's baby boy. I'm just like baby Brown. You know, I, I have this song that I do. I've got two mothers and I'm not ashamed. I've got two mothers and I love them just the same. Let me tell you about my first mother, and I talk about Dorothy Bell, who was my birth mother. She gave me life, but Mamie Brown, my adopted mother, she taught me how to live life, to be fearless, courageous, mm -hmm. and be a force for good. You just mentioned when we started this off that you just recently found your birth parents, a photo of them. I can't... Um, you know, on my, on my dad's side, my dad was adopted out. And so I don't know on my past, my dad's side, I don't know anything about my grandparents and his dad during the war in Germany was adopted out. So we don't know anything about my one side of the family. And it's curious to me, but at, at your age with the importance of family to you, did you learn, did you like, I imagine when you sought out for these people, you were hoping for something. You were hoping to learn something. You were hoping to see something. You were hoping to find something within yourself, some kind of closure or something. Did you get what you were looking for? And what was that? I was, my, my oldest son went on a search and, and I was able to find out about my birth mother and, and, and my father and my grandmother. My, my birth mother was a motivational speaker and teacher and she played the piano and she sang but she was known for speaking. My grandmother, her name is Beulah, Beulah Rucker. They have the Rucker Museum. She was a motivational speaker and she built the first school in Gainesville, Georgia for black people to learn how to read. And she went to college and she graduated at 16. She was very smart. And, but I, I said, this is interesting because my, Three brothers, my twin brother and the two brothers that I didn't know I had that she raised, none of them are like me. And, and so, but people say, well, speaking is in your blood. Well, they didn't focus and put the effort on developing that which is within them. And most people don't. I carry this picture, this picture that you see, those are my children. A good man leaves a legacy for his children and for his children's children. And so I, I said to myself, I'm just like her. When my, birth, my other brother saw me and I got out of the car and started talking to them, they said my mannerism and how I spoke and how I encouraged them to live a larger life reminded them of their mother. But I was curious. I wanted to ask them, what happened to you? Why aren't you living from this place with your life? And they haven't been. And I think people have a choice. Like, you decided. I want to do more with my life than the average person. I want to live a life that will stand out. I want to make an impact. You know, Mark, just think about that, Mark. Master something that you love. Find something that resonates with you. A job is what you get paid for, but a calling is what you're made for. Master that calling. A, answer the call. You're called to do more, to have more, to experience more, to make a greater impact impact are radical change you can't do it with who you are now you must die to who you are now to give birth to who you are to become what radical change must you make in your life so you can make your mark and k kindred spirits surround yourself with people that's going in the direction that you're going into people that 
will uplift you and you will uplift them. People who share your values, people who see themselves doing more, living a life of contribution. Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. Thank you, Mark. Live a life that will outlive you. That there is people that I believe that as much as you chose this path, you were chosen for this, for the greater work. You have what I have. They can't help it. <laughs> you can't help it. We just can't help it. That's why my brothers are not doing it. They they surrendered to the world, but we have the can't help it. We got to help people. <laughs> I, I love it. Did it bother? Has it ever bothered you that, like, I imagine you can stand from stage and you can watch like the wind going across the prairies, right? The wind rippling across the wheat fields. You could see the impact of your words as they ripple out onto the out into the audience. And you can get the laughter and you can get the claps and you can get the standing ovations. And then people get in their cars and then they drive home and they don't do anything and they don't do anything at all. That must have bothered you, no? No. No? No. Because most people, Alan Dushman, he wrote the book called Change or Die. Rather die than change. They're not going to change. They rather die. They did this study in a cardiology department of a hospital. And these are patients who had recurring heart attacks. And they were warned, if you have another heart attack, you will die. So here's how you can minimize the possibility of that happening. One, keep stress to a minimum. Two, have social support. Meet together at least twice a week. Three, a plant-based diet. Next, have exercise and meditation. Find a sense of peace within yourself. If you do that, you will not have another heart attack and you will live a fulfilled life. Mm -hmm. Within 90 days, nine out of 10 stop. They go they back. Heart attack and they died. Only one survived with a recurring heart attack, former Vice President Cheney, because he had health care they didn't have. So that's why we're taught the road to life is straight and narrow. And few there be that are willing to discipline themselves. Socrates said the undisciplined life is an insane life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what we have to do is be a good example. We must be not just the messenger, but be the message and allow people to make the choices to live the kind of life that they want to live. I remember trying to help my twin brother lose weight. And I gained 25 pounds. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? So my children, as you can see behind me, these are different people who have different journeys. And I, I hold myself to a higher standard so that I leave a good name for them. God said to Abraham, I'll make your name great. They didn't even say, I'll make you a great man. Just say, I'll make your name great. And so... I'm working to leave a good name for my children and for my children's children. And so with that, in the heady days of the heights of your career, how were you able to not allow the success, the money, access to drugs or alcohol, access to women and people throwing themselves at you? All the things, I mean, I'm not saying you're a rock star, but at the same time, you're kind of a rock star. You're, you're, the, you're, you're the person on stage. You're the person in the spotlight. You're the person everyone wants a piece of. How did you stay grounded through all of that? Because somebody paid a price for me to be here. And I believe that when you have a sense of destiny, when you feel that that there's something that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. 
when you work to develop yourself and strengthen your character, T.D. Jakes has a saying, Lord, don't let my talent take me where my character can't keep me. That when you know the reason why you are here, the purpose of your life, that narrows the choices that you make, Mm. the places where you go, the people that you hang around, the the, the, the things that you focus on. And, and so what kept me in check is my love for motivation. Mm. The, the speeches that I listen to, I teach what you listen to, you turn into. <laughs> so you really, you really do love it. You really do love it after all these years. I mean, it's like it, oh, like yes. it pours out of you. Mm-hmm. I can't help it. <laughs> God, that can't help it. <laughs> Mark, God is love. And he who dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in them. And I remember when we were coming back, my mother and I, from Miami Beach. After I had been beaten up by her. Mm. And And I asked her, Mama, why can't we stay over here? And she said, we just can't. I said, but why? Because we are black and they hate us. But she said, but don't you be like them. Don't you be like them. You love people. God is love. You love people no matter what. Do you understand? Yes, my mama. My mother loved people. And I'm Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. <laughs> I love people. I love that. So with what you're doing today, flash forwarding, you know, looking to the future, you're not stopping, you're not slowing down. I mean, everyone else might be retiring, but you still have many years ahead of you. Um, what would I, and I don't know if you would use these words or not, but I think you've been always very gifted at obviously you found your voice and with what you're able to do with others, you're able to help them find their voice. It's more though than just standing up and talking. It's more than just courage. It's more than just getting on a soapbox. Like it's, it's about knowing the impact that words can have. It's about being able to control the dialogue and how you want to be perceived. Like it's so much more than just standing up and talking with the current generation, the current cohort of people who are all desperately wanting to say, look at me, look at me. Like some people just want to be famous as opposed to helping. Some people want to just be heard as opposed to communicating a message that matters. And so as you help people find their voice and coach them and craft them, what are the things that you know, because you can feel it having done it so long where you're like, this is what to focus on. The, my Angelo said, and I spent a day with her, the mm-hmm. poor laureate. She said, it aggravates me when people say I'm gifted, a gifted communicator. She said, show me a gifted heart surgeon. She said, I'm trained. I love this. This is who I am. There's a difference between being in something and that something is in you. And I work with speakers. The speaking industry has been hijacked by speakers who speak to sell. Mm -hmm. And I say to the ones that I train, speak to transform lives. But first, have a ritual and an ongoing program to change yourself. You cannot bring about change in others if you're not willing to be in an ongoing process of discovering the truth of who you are. And that's an evolving process. That's not change, that's transformation. And never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. I'm not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. Religious people are afraid of going to hell. But to me, hell is what you experience 
when you die and you meet the person that you were supposed to become, mm -hmm. you see the work that you're supposed to do. And so when I'm working with these speakers, I say to them that this is a mission possible, that it's possible with what people are going through. The suicide rate has been spiked. The divorce rate up 40%. People, violent. millions of people have broken hearts and empty pockets in a dark place. But it's possible that when they hear your voice, they'll come out into the light. When they hear your voice, you will give them hope. When they hear your voice, if they have a gun held to their head, something in your voice, the power, the passion, the conviction, cause them to stop and say, life is God's gift to me. And how I live my life is my gift to God. I dare spit in the face of God and say, thank you for giving me life, but I'm going to take it now. You have something special. You have words that can transform people. You speak death and life. Understand that we are channels. We are vessels who are being used. We are here, not for ourselves. Our story happened to us, but it's not for us. It's for those who hear us. And the story you are setting on, someone is waiting on, that can change their lives. I spent a lot of time on working on the messenger, a lot of time, rather than... But the voice of doubt within us would say, there's a sea of people. I don't want to be just another one, right? Just one of many. Um, and it's just everybody's talking and nobody's listening. And there's lots of just blah, blah. Like, it feels, everything feels so oversaturated. And I have a friend, you know, you know, my friend, Evan Carmichael, he always says there's, there's always room at the top for quality. There's always room at the top for, for the quality, for the best. But even myself, even as dedicated and committed as I am, I have high hopes. I like, like my, my vision of where I will be in five years. I don't even want to say out loud because it feels laughable. That's how big it seems. And there are so many people who do what I do. There's so many people who do what you do, not at your level, <laughs> but there's lots of them. And so we bump up against this, like, is it even worth it if I can't stand out? Is it even worth Never it? Never ask that question, is it worth it? Because it is. Mark, you're talking to somebody and looking at someone at Kansas Citizens of America, they said, Mr. Brown, your PSA is 2,400. Mr. Brown, you're dealing with fourth stage cancer. It's when that metastasized the seven areas of your body, including your spine. How are you still here? Guess what? I don't focus on that. I do what I need to do, making good choices. Am my eating? and my mindset, and my relationships, and living a meaningful life. And I don't ask myself the question, does it really matter? Am I making any impact? That's none of my business. I'm going to do what I can, where I am, with what I have. There's a young boy that I used to visit when he was in the hospital named Foster. And Foster had terminal cancer. And I'll never forget the day he said to me, Mr. Brown? I said, yes. He said, when you come tomorrow, he said, I might not be here. I said, Foster, why would you say that? He said, don't try and motivate me now. I just, I just feel I might not be here. He said, but will you live the life 
that I don't get to live. Give me your hand. And I held his little hand. He said, promise me, tears coming out of his eyes, will you live the life that I don't get to live for me? I said, yes, Foster. Yes, but you'll be here tomorrow. But yes, I will. And will you remember? I said, yes. He said, thank you. Thank you. And sure enough, the next day, I got a call. Mr. Brown, we thank you so much for coming up and visiting all the kids, but we lost one. And I said, who was it? They said, it's Foster. I said, oh, God. I think he knew he had a premonition. And I feel when I speak that there are people who are gone that I'm living the life they didn't get to live. Like Foster, who are pulling for me. And that we all have a responsibility to do that. We are blessed. We are blessed, man, when we wake up in the morning. I'm not in pain now. I, used, I was confined to a wheelchair because of the pain from the cancer and sciatica pain. I'm free of pain. I wake up in the morning. Sometimes I can just jump up. Sometimes I can't. And in those challenging moments, I have to find a sense of peace. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. My niece and, and a good friend of hers left me in the house by myself and I couldn't get out of bed. And they were gone longer than I had anticipated. And I had to calm myself. Don't focus on whatever fire breaks up. How long will I be here? I can't get up to go to the bathroom. Don't focus on that. Keep yourself calm. Keep yourself calm. Calm yourself. I'm at peace. Calm yourself. If you mess on yourself, they deserve it. They have to clean you up. <laughs> That'll learn them, and then you moon them. Sure enough, I got a chance to moon them. <laughs> they left you for a long time, did they? Yes, they didn't leave me by myself anymore. <laughs> we have to control the dialogue in our head. Hmm. That's where the power is. A tree can't be anything but a tree. Alligator can't be anything but an alligator. But choose ye this day whom ye shall serve, your fears or your faith. And faith, not tested, can't be trusted. I love it. We've, we've had, I mean, the most remarkable conversation, so I want to thank you. But I, I want to ask you this final question. So for you, with everything that you've done and everything you have in front of you, at the end of the day, it all comes down to what? I hope that I lived a life that made a difference. It, it, you hope, I do or you don't, you don't kids, know that you did? My mother taught me self-praise brings no recommendation. <laughs> they asked me when I have kids, I train them, and I have them write their eulogy. They said, Mr. Brown. I said, yes. What do you want said about you? And I said, I want them to say I aspired to inspire until I expire. That's it. I'm living life on my terms. It's great to be me. 
and I'm going to inspire till I leave here. <laughs> oh, behave. Hello. Whatever. <laughs> what a legend Mr. Les Brown is. <laughs> Connecting with him one-on-one? -on -one? Oh, that was an extraordinary experience. Okay, three key takeaways from this talk. Number one, no matter what you're facing, it's your job to find a way to win in every situation. Number two, the classic line still rings true today. Where focus goes, energy flows. Keep your mind focused on where you want to go and not on what's happened in your past. And number three, stop questioning the worth and impact of what you're doing because it's easy. It's always easy to find all the reasons why not to do something, but it takes real conviction and real courage to drive ahead with the one reason to do something. And that one reason is your reason. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you've got to face the difficult. You've got to face the scary and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But always remember, you, me, we, we're not just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. You have got to hear how this man survived two rounds of terminal cancer, going on to climb Mount Everest and every other major mountain in the world. And he skied to the South Pole and the North Pole with only one lung. Click on the video right over there to hear this real, inspiring conversation.